Welcome Escalon Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're here and watching a conversation between uh, Jim Edwards and myself. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Troy. Nice to be here. Give you a little history about my uh, time with Jim. I arrived at Jamestown College in 1992, and in my first year, I took a course on Romans with Jim, and eventually took New Testament Greek from Jim, which launched me into a uh, a late edition of a religion philosophy major. And uh, Jim and his wife, Janie, have been very much um, a part of my own journey to the call of ministry. Uh, I've been very supportive along the way, in good times and in bad, and uh, have been really a uh, rock for me recently. And uh, I'm really grateful that I can now call them friends. Jim is talking to us today from his study in uh, Spokane, Washington. So you look good, Jim. Thank you. Nice to be with you. It's kind of ironic that we're both in lockdown, but able to communicate in more expansive ways than we ever have before. Yeah, it is fascinating. <laughs> so we're having a conversation about the early church and uh, <clears throat> You just put the finishing touches on a manuscript about the early church and the really explosive growth in the first 75 years. Tell us a little bit about the title of that and um, uh, the trajectory of that before we jump into some specific questions. Well, thank you, Troy. Uh, I'm glad to be able to talk a little bit about this because I think it's a, a very exciting topic. The um, the title of the book is going to be From Christ to Christianity, How the Jesus Movement Became the Christian Church in Less Than a Century. The thing that got me started on this is uh, one of those obvious things that we all know, but we just sometimes don't think about the meaning of, and that is when you, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, anybody who reads the Gospels, if I were to say, uh, name 10 characteristics of Jesus' ministry, what would we say? Well, we'd say uh, it's rural. Um, he's ministering to Jews. He speaks Hebrew or Aramaic, Jewish languages. Ministers in synagogues. Has apostles as followers meets on Sabbath, so forth. We all know that. If you go just one lifetime later, the early church, Ignatius, for example, who uh, ministers in Antioch at the end of the first century, one lifetime, and look at his letters to his churches, the forms are completely changed. The church is no longer rural, it's urban. It's no longer Jewish, but it's Gentile. It's no longer speaking Hebrew or Aramaic, it's speaking Greek. It's no longer calling apostles, it has Presbyterians, it has elders and bishops. <laughs> it doesn't meet in synagogues, it meets in churches, it doesn't meet on Sabbath, it meets on Sunday. Think of those changes. The church was never ever taught by Jesus not to meet on sun Saturday, nor to become a church. Yet within one lifetime, the entire form of the Christian experience is different from Jesus. And that seemed to me worth a book, but here's the main reason it's worth a book, that the backbone of the church, its DNA has not changed. So we've got this monumental form in structure and in expression, change. And yet this absolute firm constancy in the message of the gospel and the ministry of Jesus. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. And for your own study, uh, you bracketed 75 years. Give me the start and end of that. From for your own purposes, right? I, if we 
know that we, we know that Jesus uh, ministered in the late 20s. His crucifixion is perhaps in the year 30. Let's just put it right at the year 30. Uh, we know that Ignatius is killed in the year 105. There's 75 years. And that's the length of a, a long lifetime. Not everybody in the ancient world lived to be 75, but lots of people did. A lot more than we think. Paul tells Timothy not to enroll widows under 60, so that means that people had a longer lifespan than sometimes we think. Yeah, sure. Well, let's talk about this um, this outreach of the church into this uh, Greek culture. Um, how did it move so quickly and so um, creatively from uh, entirely Jewish context into the Greek known world at the time? Well, we don't know all the answers to that, but um, here's what we do know. We, we can say in terms of a general overview that there was no movement, no religion, no culture, no association in the ancient world that permeated the ancient world as thoroughly as the church did. And at the same time, continued to remain constant in its allegiance to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. We all know that it's the case that the more entirely we identify with something, the more likely it is that we will start to assimilate to it, to become like it. It's always a temptation. Mm -hmm. But the early church moves um, into the world like the Jewish religion, of course, uh, basically did not move into Gentile areas. The religions of Rome and Greece did not move into the slave communities. And none of them moved in outside of the Roman Empire into what they would have called the pagan barbarian world. Christianity transgresses all of these borders and more of them. Deals with children, for example, in a remarkable way that neither Jews nor Greeks did. People of different languages and cultures. So it has this tremendous uh, permeating influence. Um, it's adaptive, but here, here's the great thing. It doesn't become captive to the culture. It retains its own identity so that it becomes a focal point of influence rather than simply as an assimilated subculture. Yeah, that's great. Now, of course, a lot of the credit for this, this permeation uh, particularly with respect to the writings of the New Testament, is the Apostle Paul, which, of course, uh, we look at in, in very honorable ways, the way in which he really engaged in this systematic outreach to the known Greek world at that time. And it might be said that the Apostle Paul himself is kind of an unrepeatable um, task, an unrepeatable figure in the early church, uh, um, what do we know about post-Paul in terms of um, personalities and teachers that were involved in the expansion of the ministry? Is it credited to Paul, or is Paul kind of a, a starter, or is Paul an exception to the rule? Well, you're, you're certainly right about Paul. Uh, the Christian church has never had a missionary, another Paul. Not even uh, Martin Luther or Augustine accomplish what Paul did. Paul was um, an entirely unique figure. But we have to remember that Paul dies in the mid-60s, and the purview of my study takes us for another 40 years after that. And it really is in that second half of the first century in the 70s, 80s, Roman persecution is beginning that we see the church become what we know as the church. It already is taking form in Paul's day, but it's not matured. And so we come up with this uh, 
what I think is a very encouraging fact, and that is that the, the ultimate mission maturity of the church is not dependent upon great superstars, even the Apostle Paul. That the church that we know by the year 100 is what it is because of countless unnamed, unknown lay people. It wasn't a top-down imposition. These were grassroots movements. These changes, say, from Hebrew to Greek or from Sabbath to Sunday didn't take place at the same time. They weren't orchestrated. They took place sooner in some places, later in others. We have here a, a very organic change that's taking place by what we would call uh, an educated and a committed laity. And that's pretty exciting because um, I think we live in an age in which we sometimes lament the fact that we don't have great leaders like we um, at least thought we had in the past. Maybe they weren't as great as we thought. But uh, this means that uh, it's for people like ourselves that the responsibility um, for uh, this responsibility exists, not for some people greater than ourselves. There's great hope for our time as well. Very good. We, we often hear in studies of the early church that the, the massive spread of it is a connection between the ministry of the church and the political power of the empire. And certainly when we get to Constantine, your own study, you're looking at really a phenomenal expanse of the church far before that conversation even comes about. Tell us about how the early church looked at their role in this expansion and, and, and to what degree was, um, did they do so in such a way that they weren't all that concerned about the role of the empire or, uh, at the time? Well, that's a, it's a great question. I think it would have struck the early churches somewhat surprising though, because it assumes that the church is going to gain hegemony. It's going to gain control and influence that in time will in fact overcome the Roman empire itself. And it does that. It does that in Constantine in the year 325, but that's still 300 years after the life of Jesus. And those 300 years were difficult years. They were not years of victory. They were years of many, many defeats. There were martyrdoms. There were persecutions. There were setbacks. And frankly, there was ministry going on in parts of the empires east of the Roman Empire, today what we would call Iran, um, Central Asia, India. That was fantastic. North Africa as well that we know nothing about. We have the Book of Acts, which tells us a lot about the spread of the church from Jerusalem to Rome, but we know virtually nothing about its spread east and south, and yet we know that it spread as rapidly and as thoroughly there as it did towards Rome. So we're dealing with a lot of ignorance, but here's what we do know. The early church wasn't setting out to uh, cause the downfall of the Roman Empire. It wasn't really setting out to uh, displace Judaism. It saw itself as a fulfillment of Judaism not its eradication. It simply committed itself to some basic things uh, that we can commit ourselves to as well. Number one, uh, the transformation of individual lives. And those lives were evangelized by people like us. They didn't have strategies. They didn't have programs. They didn't have um, all of the various um, programs that we have seen in our own time. These were basically one-on-one -on -one contact with people, acts of kindness, sharing the gospel. And then this was augmented by a very thorough um, catechumenate, which was a training practice in the Christian church, which took individual people like us and formed them into a community of followers who in both their worship and in their witness had a remarkable influence in the society. 
But most of this was under the radar. It's not until 150 years after Jesus dies that what we would call the New York Times, the leaders of the society, the intellectuals start to take notice of Christianity and start to deal with it. 150 years is quite a while. Wow. In that time, the church has been secretly, not secretly, um, individually, carefully, conscientiously going about its business of bearing witness to Christ in word and deed. So in terms of his permeation, how important to the early church was its message? And what was its message? Well, that's, that is the early church because we, um, we, we can surely say that the early church did not, as I've said before, and you've said the same, did not set out to overthrow structures. It set out to bear witness to the gospel in its Jewish and Roman context and allow the gospel to begin to permeate and transform those cultures as it would. And the entire message of the early church is simply the message of Jesus Christ. When we read the book of Acts, one-fifth of the book of Acts consists of speeches. If you take those speeches and set them side by side, there's about 15 of them. Some of them are very short. Some of them are pretty long. You put them side by side and ask yourself the question, what is the commonality or is there a commonality in any of these, these speeches? You'll find that there's a basic capsule. There's a summary substructure, a skeleton. It has three parts, every one of the speeches. Uh, first of all, they start with the promises of God in the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So these speeches talk about Christianity as the fulfillment, the purposeful maturation of what God has done in Israel. Secondly, Jesus Christ has several points. He was a person who did good according to the power of God. He was crucified for the purposes of God. He was resurrected by the power of God. He was exalted to the right hand of the right hand of God. And he will return to judge the world for the sake of God. All of these statements about Jesus Christ profile him as the God man who enters into our life to accomplish God's salvation. And the third point is let all who hear this message believe it repent, and be baptized. So there you have the call to the communal church, the response of commitment. The promises of God in the Old Testament, the life of Jesus Christ, and hearing, believing, repenting, baptism. The entire message is Christ. There's no programs, no strategies, nothing else. It's Jesus Christ. And so the, 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 here's the, the DNA of the church that although its structures are changing uh, tremendously, its backbone, its core, its purpose, its North Star and guiding point is not changing. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's great. When we, when we consider this trajectory of the early church, um, do you see points of contact between uh, the study of this uh, first 75 years of explosive growth to our own context right now? And of course, I'm beginning to think right now of uh, the ways in which um, my boys, Andrew and David, are experiencing things much differently than I did. And I'm sure I experienced uh, culture and the church much differently than you did as you were growing up in uh, the mountains. So um, are you excited or are you nervous about the future of the church in light of all this? No, I'm excited. I, I think I could say um, without too much exaggeration that 
the world that we're living in today, the culture that we are practicing our Christianity today is closer to the experience of the early church's experience than perhaps any time in Western history. We are living in a time in which what we call Christendom, the era in which the church kind of defined Western civilization is coming to an end. Christianity is not coming to an end, but it's very comfortable and long lasting political and cultural alliance with Western culture is coming to an end, know that. And in many ways, that was the, that would describe well the circumstance of the early Christian church in the Roman empire. We live in a day in which Christianity is becoming a minority rather than a majority movement in culture. People are less and less familiar with Christianity and the gospel in our own cultures. This is true in Escalon, it's true in Spokane, it's true everywhere. We can't take it for granted that people know the first thing about Christian Christianity. We see a lack of uh, Christian leaders. We're living in a day in which most of our brains and our brawn and our money is going into science, technology, STEM subjects, not into uh, Christi Christianity, not into Christian leaders. We're seeing many, many spiritual alternatives. There's a huge amount of spiritual spirituality experimentation going on. There's an openness to new forms of mission in the church. Look at what we're doing here. You and I are communicating in new ways because we have to and new forms of outreach, all of these things that characterize us could equally characterize and did the early church. So it's pretty exciting for us to read their story. Their story is not ours, and of course ours isn't theirs, but their witness can be both informative and also very inspiring to us. I think it makes a lot of sense because the church is going to have to think through things that we've already talked about here. How is it we can be adaptive to this changing society, but not captive to its mores and do so by as ordinary believers. I really like that phrase. It doesn't require superstar uh, ministry, but that we can change lives one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I look at my own spiritual journey of which you've been a part and um the one-on-one -on -one conversations are the things I remember most and not any type of prepackaged program. Um, and so uh, this is encouraging to hear, Jim. Well, scripture and history are uh, great gifts to us, aren't they? Yeah. We, um, we contribute to the historical development of the church and the um, rules of the game seem to be changing in our day, but the game isn't changing. And we still have the promise of God that he is with us always, that the church is his bride, and that he is using the church as the greatest evangelist more than any person. It itself is the greatest evangelist because it's the, the living communal representation of what God wills to do with his people. That's happening in Escalon. It's happening here in Spokane. We have a lot to learn from the early church to help us in our journey. Really appreciate your time, Jim. Blessings to you and Janie. Thank you. Nice talking with you, Troy. Blessings to you.